Yes. Yes. <laughs> My name is Dr. Suzanne DeBenedettis, and I have the honor of having Greener Way Associates host Melina Watts, the author of Tree. Now, you may wonder why I'm so interested in this book. But like everyone today, we know it's beyond the climate crisis. It's actually chaos at this point where we never know what's going to happen next. But we can change. There's still that teensy window of opportunity if we learn how to live with our ecosystems. And how about learning how to do so in a very, very reader-friendly way? And with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, who is helping fulfill Greener Way's mission, which is to educate in the pillars of the Earth Charter. More on that later. Uh, Ms. Watts, please tell us why we all should be reading this book today and taking action. Well, it's funny because when you ask the question directly, it takes the end of my talk and moves it right to the front, which is, um, you know, tree is the story of a California live oak written from the point of view of the tree. So the tree is the narrator. And what interests me about this experience of writing this book and having people read it is when I first wrote the book, I thought I was writing about a tree. But of course, as you know, as a plant person, when you write about a tree, you're also writing about the, the, the species that live under the ground that coexist with it. You're writing about the other um, the grass and the sage and the birds and the, the, the pollinators, and pretty soon you're writing about this whole ecosystem. So people have told me, readers have told me, that the book is a love letter to the Santa Monica Mountains, mm -hmm. and it's really focused on the whole ecosystem. And um, I used ecological history as a lens because when you're looking at uh, a tree that lives to be 229 years old, there's a lot of change that we've seen in California in that time period. In the beginning, we had uh, in where the tree is living, we have the Shumash, and adjacent you have uh, the Tongva and the San Fernandino and the other tribes. Uh, and then the Spanish came, and you had that unsettled culture. And then you had cowboys showing up, and pretty soon we became California, and you end with new money. And an ecological history lens means that you look at what's growing on the landscape with the idea of that every human culture has a huge impact on what grows there and how it grows there or whether it doesn't grow there at all. And so each cultural system has its own emotional, spiritual, legal framework for how to coexist with everything else. And so as these different cultures dominate the landscape, you can see the ecosystem ebb and flow and change over time. So when people read tree, they start to reconsider what's our, what's our, um, what's our cultural framework with how we look at the landscape. And is this how we really want to treat the landscape? And so um, this leads kind of to the, the big idea I've had the last year or two, which is, um, it, of course, you're familiar with this, but people talk about the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene is this idea that we have these huge geological eras, you know, um, the Cenozoic or the Jurassic or whatever. And in each of these um, big geological eras, you have entire different species of, of, of animals and plants that predominate. Well, because of how human beings have treated the landscape by putting down freeways and damming up rivers and painting over entire, you know, hundreds of miles at a time, or turning hundreds of miles of open space into highly structured agricultural systems, we have effectively changed the geology. So Anthropocene means a human-based geological era. And sadly, it hasn't been an improvement from the perspective of every other being with whom we coexist, right? And so simply, if you look at what's happening, even the human species is starting to wake up and say, uh, Anthropocene can be the bridge or it can be the death knell of all of us who are living, walking, talking today. So I love what you're saying. Okay. I, not I, figure, I figure that we're on the same page. So, so, so I guess what I'm saying is when people start telling me this isn't just a book about a tree, this is a book about the whole ecosystem, right? And you can't, you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, you're for the whole experience of, of the Santa Monica Mountains and every living being that coexists there, right? If we take that ecosystem first mentality, if we embrace every living being as having importance, if you, 
if you acknowledge the little grass that's now set next to tree in the first chapter, as it's important as tree, which is as important as the rock next to tree, you start to get this framework that of the Buddhists would have that we're part of a community of all living beings. And every First Nations uh, community with which I've ever had any connection has this concept that we're brothers and sisters with the plants and animals that we live here. So if you take this concept that that really our family is all of us, and I don't mean just the people sitting around listening and talking with me today, I mean every plant in your garden, and I mean you know the birds of the sky. We're all part of the living community. We place all of that first before we do anything else. If you put biodiversity first and then you take action, it will change what you do with your business, it will change what you do with your kids' education, it will change what holiday you take, it will change the policy that you expect your policymakers to make, it will change capitalism. So I guess my perspective is if we start putting biodiversity first, if we put all living beings first, we will move out of the Anthropocene and into the Biocene. I want to have a new geological era. I want to have life come first, not man and woman come first. I want to have all life come first. And so our, this book, Tree, to me, is a shortcut for how to move out of the Anthropocene and into the Biocene. And how do we do that? We embrace all living beings. What you just said is critical. In fact, Antonio Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the UN, a couple of years ago when we start having the chaos with the heat dome, had said we are really on a rolling highway we are going so fast into the next age of extinction that would destroy everything we know as life on this planet. However, the other species would find ways to re adapt and regenerate, but the human will become totally extinct. And if you think about it, because we're the most complex beings, you can cut a lizard's tail off, it will grow another one. You can cut a worm in half. So many animals know how to regenerate even after they've been despoiled by our hopefully innocent ignorance, but definite self-destructive ignorance that we must wake up now. And with that, I turn it over to you to tell us more about the bio scene or about the, uh, well, I want, the book. I want to get back to the book, but I want to answer what you're saying with that level of, you know, extinct, extinction angst, for lack of a better word, and, you know, climate change grief, which I definitely have experienced. I had the experience of being asked to speak on Earth Day to Crossroads School last year, and they wanted to hear about my book. But when the actual kids were invited to do the Q&A, right, and they were all on the environmental committee, so it was like very brilliant young women, all of them. I'm like, we're boys. But um, th these young women, we got up there, we started doing Q&A, &A, and it ended up not being about my book. It ended up being kids asking me, hey, we heard you're a watershed coordinator. We heard you're working in conservation. Are we all going to die? Is there any hope? And so my answer is absolutely there's hope if we put biodiversity first. And all of this emphasis on climate change is incredibly important. We've got to reduce our carbon footprint. But we also have to start thinking about coexisting with all the other living beings. So I would say, you know, when you think about soil health, that's about allowing biodiversity to continue. If you don't take care of the soil, nothing else is going to work. When we think about facing the drought, we need to think about how to keep naturalized creek and river systems functioning. Because a creek or a river is like the, the arteries and the veins for every other species that lives in, in our communities with us. If you get rid of all those creeks and rivers because you're desperately trying to make sure that people survive, you'll destroy everything. So what, uh, what I'm saying with facing climate change, biodiversity first, and climate change first, start thinking about, but technically, if you think about it, we all evolved from the same stuff on Earth, literally are our brothers and sisters, right? So, um, since you did ask me to focus on the book, I'll bring it back in a little bit. <laughs> all of this stuff is important, but it's all interrelated. But I, so, I like that you're going to focus on the book because the book is so good, it will change your heart. Similar to years ago when the book Ishmael came out also. And this is the one meeting the crisis of our time, moving from Anthropocene to Biocene. Please. Okay, so people always ask me, why did you write a book about a tree from the point of view of the tree? And I have this story that's true that happened to me that 
I was pretty certain the first time I told it that I would never work in conservation again. Because when you work in conservation, as, as you would know as a professor, there's all this emphasis on data and research and science, and you have to be really serious to get the gig, right? And this is a spiritual experience that happened to me, which is completely out of there. So when I was a freshman in college, I actually went to UCLA and graduated from UCLA with a degree in history, but my freshman year, I was down at UC San Diego. And literally every person I knew had gone to school on the East Coast. And so I was feeling really isolated and lonely down in San Diego, and my wonderful roommate wasn't there that weekend. And it was a Friday night, and it looked like everybody else had a date or a party or something fun but me. And I had just realized I, in fact, was not going to make it as a doctor because I'm terrible in math, and those two things do not go together. And I was just feeling really super high. Come on, join us. Um, I was feeling disappointed in myself academically, and I was feeling isolated and sad and lonely. And frankly, I was so depressed, I was, I was suicidal. And I just couldn't face going back into the dorm and being alone and hearing other people's music and other people's shining lights. And I just... I couldn't take it, so I, I lay down on the grass in the middle of the quad, and while I was laying there, and the sun was starting to set, I felt this individual piece of grass pop up right in front of my chest, and it kind of said, how are you? And I kind of emoted at it, ah! you know, for lack of a better word, and it gave me love, and I can't say it spoke to me, but it felt like it felt like you feel when a pop of light comes at you. It felt like energy coming right into my heart. And I went, oh, like that, right? And then it kind of said, because again, not words, but I heard it. I felt it. It said to the two pieces of grass next to it, we have a human animal here. She's not doing well. You, you got to talk to her. So these other two pieces of grass pop light at me. And then they talked to each other. And pretty soon, the entire field of grass was emoting at me all at the same time. And it felt as if you were having a bad day and you walked out in the backyard and a giant orchestra was playing Tchaikovsky just for you. It was unbelievable. And I lay there listening to it and saying thank you and loving it back and forth until I was so cold I couldn't feel my toes anymore. And I, I left just feeling uh, full of light and joy. And this book was written for that field of grass to say thank you. For, for the rescue, right? Mm -hmm. And I've had the experience since then, or before then also, of connecting with trees. And I feel like a lot of us have connected with trees. I find it's very surprisingly common for people to want to tell me about their tree story, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like our culture romanticizes puppies and kitties, and we don't adequately um, uh, talk about how important um, plants are and, and what our emotional relationship with plants is. So when I talk about, you know, opening up to all living beings, I'm specifically mean we gotta we gotta listen to the plants and we gotta love them and love them back. And so, you know. Yeah. As a puppy lover and I have two little ones there, I also live for my trees and my rose bushes. And they are the most neglected beloveds <laughs> that we just use and use and expect it to be there or them to be there. And I myself had a similar experience many really? years ago, and I'll keep my story lasered, to having rose bushes as my only friends that I could go out and talk to and cry with and feel held, feel embraced, and Words are only 7% of human uh, conversation, mm -hmm. of, of dialogue. Affect, gesture, and tone are the other 93%. And we all have a felt sense and connection with nature at every level. And we have a nature expert with us, Dr. Peter Severanen, who um, can tell us all about the underground jungle and the light and so on. But we all have that connection in our genes. Yes. And we have the ability to learn to listen with the ears of our soul. And if we get quiet, which our culture needs to learn if we are going to survive, and listen, we will learn ever so much. And I believe your book is one of the most magnificent prompts. So back to you, Melina. Well, um, I love it that the rose bushes talk to you. My mom was a rosarian, so it's, it's very touchy to me. Um, 
we, we, you, you asked me to talk about two other things before I actually do some meetings from the book that I think are interrelated. Um, and again, we have a professor in the ticket speech that's better than I can. But if you, if you, if you love wildlife, right, and you want to help wildlife thrive, inevitably the best thing you can do is restore the plant communities that the, the big megafauna that you love are part of. If you bring back all the plants that live in a community, all the other species that coexist with it have habitat and they have food and they have they have a place they want to be. So I'm all about planting native plants. So for us in the Santa Monica Mountains, we have our own specific palette of native plants. But wherever you are that you're listening to this, you know, research what are the native plants that live in your community and figure out like the most five pop populous trees that would have historically lived in your area, plant some in your garden, plant some in your school, plant some in your business, and you are bringing back the wild. You're becoming a part of it. Um, one of the things about native plants in uh, the Santa Monica Mountains is very important. I work in water conservation, and um, if you plant native plants, they are designed to coexist with the amount of rainfall we have, with the amount of seasons and rain that we have. So you can, once you get them established, you can let them go survive the amount of water we have. So figuring out how to, to restore native plants is is the answer to um, uh, a lot of conservation questions. Now some people will say, but we need food. And what I'm learning is that we can have both the plants to feed us with the biodiverse native plants, some of which can feed us also more. As I've learned, there are plants that are friendly with one another that are not food-bearing plants, that are not necessarily, they're neither invasive, but they also bring the bees and other parts of the ecosystem. So please don't think life is either or. It's both, right? Yeah. Because and in view of what you said, um, the USDA, National Resource Conservation Service, is a huge advocate for what they call hedgerows. And a hedgerow is basically a perimeter garden around a field or around an orchard or through an orchard or field that includes native plants. And so the hedgerows become like sort of a, a home base for the pollinators who then go back and forth from the field to their hedgerow. And it becomes a way to allow um, wildlife to go from, say, one national park to one state park through 14 farms because you have these hedgerows that are like little zigzaggy paths for every other species. Beautiful. Yeah. By the way, we're seeking to create a park to playa path mm. for hikers, but I believe the uh, Bayona Creek Renaissance and Audubon Society are also, actually they've been certificated to do the biodiversity planting also in that corridor so that the plants and the wildlife can exist. So what I'm hearing from you, unless we really have our natives in place, native plants, uh, or let's put it this way, by putting them in place, we're putting the order of things in place again. But please tell us more about your book and or the conversation right, we're right. slipping well, into. Well, I think, um, you know, when you think about native plants, sometimes people have these very really large ideas of, I'm going to turn my entire backyard into a national park, which you could totally do, and I recommend it if you want to. But even if you just plant a few sages or a couple trees, you're contributing to um, the network of native plants that we need for, for plants to exist. So I want to go back to this idea that uh, uh, different human cultures have different cultural values which impact ecosystems. So I'm going to rewind and look at some of the California history and how different cultural values impacted what we have. So in particular, um, I did a lot of research looking at the Chumash and the Tonga, and I want to address the concept of appropriation head on and say, um, in no way, shape, or form am I appropriating. I am learning from, and I am saying thank you, and I'm having respect for the cultures that lived here that did a beautiful job of coexisting with nature. And I have had Chumash friends say, please listen to us and please share it because we want LA to do a better job of living on our ecosystem. And they did a better job. So these ideas that I'm sharing from their culture are, are 
meant to be shared the way I was told, right? They're right. They're right. They're right. They're right. They're right. So, we just so, so one of the things that's super interesting is um, acorns uh, were the backbone of not only Schumach culture, but many native cultures throughout California, right? And the interesting thing with acorns is compared to like rice or corn or wheat or other, you know, backbones of civilization in other places, they have much higher percentage fat, much higher percentage protein. So if you run out of everything else and you've got acorns, you're going to make it. If you run out of everything else besides rice, you'll go on for a while, but sooner or later it won't work, right? Acorns are like kind of like the great gift, right? And um, a really cool thing about the acorn mast, which is what we call the acorn crop of year, is if you have a bad year for, say, uh, uh, um, you know, the California live oak or whatever it is that you have been using as your primary source, typically the other trees will have more. So they have different levels of harvest depending on the conditions, right? And the Shumash and other native people had a cultural value system that said you cannot take every acorn. You can take a percent, maybe half, maybe two thirds, depending on who was telling you. But you had to leave some behind because you were supposed to share them with the other animals. You were supposed to allow some to regrow. And it would have been criminal to take all of them. And it was literally beyond their imagination that you would or would do such a thing. So it's a completely different mindset, right? Uh, another interesting thing is, um, you know, when um, American settlers came to California, they did a huge number on the oaks, particularly in Central California. They took them all down so they could turn it into farms. They took them and they turned them into railroad tracks and houses and also a lot of firewood. And it was it was awful. So. So the Oakland savanna habitat is very threatened because of that period of massive overharvesting. The Native American cultural value system, in particular, again, I'm speaking to Shumash, not all tribes, they did stuff like peel off the first layer of bark, and that was the source for their fire. So it was a way of using, but not abusing, and, and respecting that the oak tree was not owned by an individual, it was owned by a family unit, and it would be inherited for five or six or seven generations. So you were taking care of that oak because your great great grandchildren were going to use that same oak. So it was a different a different mentality. Um, then uh, when the Spanish came, there were certain cultural values that were super beautiful that I feel like actually have informed what makes California lovable in some ways, right? So one of their traditions was if you had a guest come to you on a charro and they didn't have a horse, they literally had so many horses and cattle, they would give somebody a horse to ride off with. It's like totally different way of relating to capitalism per se, right? Um, and then of course, you know, we know the problems that came when we came. So like, what do we want to borrow? What do we want to share? One of the things that you could see the different, uh, the, the impact of the Spanish culture was before even the first horses and cattle and people got off the ship, they believed that the birds were already eating the grains from the grasses that the horses were eating and delivering them by poop. And they believed that the grass ecosystem in California changed before the, the, the conquistadors showed up. Now, how do we know this? There are people who are way smarter than me who went and uh, looked at the oldest adobe bricks, which is the oldest evidence of Spanish culture that we have. And they broke down these adobe bricks and they looked at the pollen and they looked at the seed type and they said, you know what? It's already like 99% European. So in other words, that's how fast it happened. And that was like an inadvertent one. The other impact of Spanish culture that I believe was totally inadvertent, but it was a disaster, is when the, when the um, contestors came, they didn't know where they're going. It was like the boldest thing. We're going to go right off and figure out what's here and take it, right? So what they did is they brought with them cattle and goats and pigs and sheep. And they herded them along with them as they're exploring. So they have food on the hoof. Well, the pigs got loose. And guess what pigs' favorite food is? Acorns. Acorns. So when you look at the missionization process and how quickly it happened and how disastrous it was, those stupid pigs were eating all the food. So, so accidental starvation was driving people towards the missions. So you look at, like, how come that happened? And I'm like, that's your answer. So these are the kind of things, when you look at ecological history, that are super interesting to me and, and have a super big impact. And in our own time, one of the biggest impacts of ecological, ecological history is linguistic, in my opinion. So 
when you look at, uh, uh, there was a couple of disasters in the 30s where LA River flooded and a lot of people died like 30 people. And back then, 30 people was like, if we lost 300 people. Like it was relative to the population, it was you know way more, right? And so that was the invention of Los Angeles County Flood Control. And they decided that the LA River was so dangerous, it, it, it would just die, but they would put it in cement boxes. So other cultures and other places and other times said, oh, it's a floodplain. Let's not build our village in the floodplain. Let's build out of the floodplain and let the floodplain come and go and come and go. And we said, ah, we need that land for us. We're going to box it and control the river. Well, how do you box it and control rivers and creeks in an area the size of Los Angeles? You stop calling them creeks and rivers. You call them flood channels. So Dominguez and Bayana are, are channels and they're flood control channels and there's storm drains if it's a storm drain it's not a creek but if it's a creek and you put some into it so you change the language and it changes how you manage it right that's so sad it is so yeah but, sad. but you, know, you go back to this idea of what kind of culture do we want to have what do we want for our future do we want to change our language to change our culture I'm just saying, it's an interesting idea. I'm throwing it out there, right? I'm processing what you're saying because we have to change what drives our language. And what drives the language today is called money, or at this point it's digital something or other, that will drive us to extinction faster than anything else. And so the language has to be from what I'm getting from you and Tree and others of good heart, that we have to start speaking that Buddhist language or the language of common sense that everything is interdependent. That's a beautiful word. If you think of your own body, uh, if we cut off your water, how long would this human body live? Cut off the air the brain gets damaged within four seconds. So we tend to take care of our body as if it's different parts, and then we jam things in to make those parts work, but we fall on our own sword, and now it's reached the global level because of the language we use. It has to be changed into the language of collaboration, cooperation, interdependence. Because think of it, if all the farm workers went on strike at one time, how much food <laughs> would you have for how long? Not very long at all. If all the food-bearing trees start to go extinct, trees and veggie, how long? And we live into, oh, we can always get more. And now the new myth is we're going to colonize planets. Uh, but if you colonize planets, you lose all of the other species. You lose the whole, you lose the joy of Eden. That we live, we live in Eden. People think of Eden as something we left. Eden's always here. We are in Eden right now if we cherish plants and animals, right? So if we live in a test tube, which is that planetary colonization as we see it, how long can life in a test tube live, literally? It's seeking to self propagate itself. We have an Eden of self propagation right in that acorn, right in that little plant that I was told recently is uh, this gentleman is growing food and he's got fennel plants and his plants, and you could see the bees and also, yes, we need food for us humans, but if we don't feed those who feed us, we ain't going to have it for long. I did a little research, and only 35% of what we call food can grow without the propagators, without the biodiversity. 65% cannot. And so, do we just want to eat potatoes the rest of our but lives? I would say there's not a single plant that's a part of agriculture that doesn't need to be part of a living soil system, that doesn't need to be part of a larger ecosystem. And you might live alone for a while, but you need to you need to bring the you need the whole thing. So, so that, I would that's, yes, this gentleman here uh, can maybe we'll have you do another talk to follow up. Uh, that what you just said is critical. You can't live without the core sustenance 
that humans evolved from. So that leads me to a fun reading in my book, which is about food. So I'm going to move to page 32, if anyone's, you know, neurotically reading along. Um, and uh, before I do so, I'm going to share with you that um, to write this book, I created a pronoun called E. And my idea was that it is sort of implies that something is not alive, like, you know, it's just inert, right? And if you look at a tree, there's certain trees that are male and certain trees that are female, but a lot of trees kind of have two for one. They're male and female at the same time. And I wanted to create a pronoun that was halfway between she and E that represented both at the same time because I wanted people to experience in their imagination what it's like to be different than us, right? And and what is it like to feel that you're giving and giving, giving like a male and receiving like a female and being the same entity at the same time, which is what a tree is, right? So um, when I use the word E, don't trip up. And the other fun side note on that is how with the writing a novel in India, the, tr the transgender community created the gender E, unrelated to me, and put it on their tax form so they didn't have to say they were she or he anymore. So I'm like, oh, maybe we're all kind of working towards the thing, same thing. So um, at this stage in the book, it starts off with the acorn, the little, uh, the little tree is very young, so it's probably about this tall, you guys. I noticed that when I read the children, they're always going to have big this tree. Um, and the grass, who is tree's best friend, is about twice as tall because grass grows faster than tree. So they're hanging out, coexisting at this point in the story. While the herd of grass was, oh, the hero of grass was Una Verbia, and Dante has kind of been the bad guy up to this point. Okay. And Una Verbia is uh, a species called Mexican sprangle grass, and Mexican sprangle grass gets to be about this tall, and it's super tall and ethereal and lacy. And I picked this species because I figured when the, 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 the oak was big and strong that this little bitty, you know, floaty piece of grass would be a, a fun contrast. Um, while the herd of grass was intensely engaged in this battle, wondering if Zant would do such a heinous thing to a sibling blade that everyone, but everyone knew Zant had loved so much, a second herd of deer was on the hoof, wandering through the meadow. The grass had known the prickly unease of dirt deer herds before. Their hooves severed the top portions of grass off and crushed young and old plants, causing the need to grow back over a week's time. And they ate the tops of plants, and sometimes they uprooted grass, and that was just that. They were blandly violent, oblivious to that which they caused. A velvety brown mouth came near the patch of grass, which included Dant, Vicium, and Univerbia. A big bite took out Dant and Dant's pack of friends, severing them off at a root, an inch above the roots. There was a universal shriek as the creature began grinding them down into food, and the silence of a noble death thereafter. Dant, suffering a mortal wound, plucked to the earth by his roots, shivering at the disappearance of 90% of his stem and blades. Luna Harvia spoke softly. Dant, you are still alive. Don't fall asleep. Don't give up. Grow. Grow. You can heal and thrive. Shocked to the core by kindness from Una Verbia, after having put me under a grass vodka, Dot cried. Una Verbia continued, grow, grow. And Dot clung to the command and put out a wish to form cells along the severed edge, oozing precious wetness into the air. Dot began to reconstruct. And in that moment, the deer's mouth came back in and neatly chopped out half of Una Verbia. True was electrified. It felt like his own core had been cleaved. To Tree's surprise, he could still feel the blade of Una Verbia that was on the deer's tongue. And the feelings that came at Tree were fast, intense, and surprising. The whole blade lay languid, surrendering as the tongue mashed strands of grass up to the root of the doe's mouth. Then, the deer twisted the grass sideways and ground teeth into the grass. As the grass was destroyed, each cell popped and gave shots of grass life force into the hungry deer and little pops of ecstatic release. The whole thing happened as swiftly as a string of firecrackers going off into light and smoke, leaving behind a dull residue that gave no sense of the evidence of beauty that had been enchanted in air only moments before. Tree felt this chunk of Univervia embraced willful dissolution, and then suddenly, all of these little pieces that had been integrated into Univervia were separated into something like Ananda, the joy which powers the universe, and then, then the grass was here. Tree looked at the deer with newfound respect. On a fundamental level, the animal was grass. The deer itself was plant. 
boggled by the inside tree could only be, still unerect, and watched the marauding deer move on. The cry of the health of Unaverme which remained torn to tree like watching a lover punch off a cliff. Tree grasped, gasped out as a last-ditch effort, Unavervia! And Unavervia grasped at the contact. Am I alive? The shortened grass shrieked. Relieved to have made contact, to have heard a voice, Tree spoke with the majesty of a grown tree, completely silencing the entire bustling herd of grass. You are still here, and you will grow. I want to cry and also can see all the science that you unwittingly packed into that magnificent story. There's so much scientific data coming out. The trees do have feelings. Again, Peter can comment on, I think I heard you say recently, Peter, uh, Dr. Peter Severin, uh, how uh, when trees start to be threatened, the outer ones die, but send in energy to keep the rest alive. I, I forget, but it's, it's like yeah. yeah, it's so amazing the science that is being taught through a really heart touching story. And what I've known as being a social analyst, doctor from USC 50 something years ago, until our affect, our heart changes. It opens to have the respect for all living beings in the earth and all the way up. Until we do, we will not have the critical change needed. And as soon as we do, there's still enough, especially in our younger generations, the 20 year olds, etc., they are desperate to make change happen now. Climate scientists are already going and doing civil disobedience because it must be done now. And your voice, my dear, is critically needed now. And for all those who are here and those who see the YouTube, I urge you to invite this, I should call you this tree. But to come and address your groups and then move from heartfelt compassion for yourself and all living beings because we are integrated, we are at one at some level, whether we recognize it or not, to start rolling up your sleeves and doing what you can see, can do, all of the different levels of uh, addressing the disruption that's needed right now. Addressing right now all that's needed, whether you're working on a watershed, you're working on removing the cement and restoring the, the blood flowing that we can't live without called water and rivers, uh, to restore the biodiversity. To There is so much that can appeal to whatever level of consciousness or time you have. You know, depending on how old or young or children to raise or whatever, everybody can do something. And uh, if there's more you'd like to read, or I have two more pieces. Awesome, I do. Because um, I and like I also want to, to I want to tie into the science that you're talking about. There's two books you might want to read that are not my book. Um, there's a book by Dr. Suzanne Samard, S I M A R D. She is a Canadian scientist who um, invented the concept of. Well, she discovered that there were fungal networks communicating between trees and, in fact, exchanging nutrients and water across species, not just their own species, which is very interesting. So she just did an autobiography that's fantastic. And it starts off a bit slow and cumbersome, and as she gets into her discoveries and the science takes off, it just gets on fire. It's a great book. And it really gives you an insight what it's like to be a scientist as a non-scientist. I was like, oh, that was awesome. The other book you want to read is by Peter Wallaby. Uh, he is um, a, a German or Austrian, I'm being dyslexic with the two countries, sorry. Um, but he was a forester, just a little bit like being a rancher, because your job is to cut and harvest the trees. And he started connecting with scientists and learning about how trees uh, do communicate with each other, and ended up convincing the village that paid him to manage the forest for money, that he could make more money off of having this forest be available for scientists and hikers than for cutting down the trees. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of great science, and his book is in little tiny chapters, so you can learn diverse amounts of tree science very quickly. It's a beautiful book. 
just a beautiful example of how he took his skill set and turned a community around for the greater good. Please read us more. So I will. I will. I will. So uh, the next part is uh, towards the end of the book. And uh, uh, for those of you who um, have ever seen E.T., um, you know the kind of suburban houses? Yes, my son is holding his hand that he has seen E.T. Uh, the suburban houses they live in, uh, this process explains how they turn the beautiful Santa Monica Mountains into the flat spaces they need to build the houses on. And this is, in fact, the area around the tree that, where this happens. Um, Bulldozers arrived, and the men shouted and jeered, and as the men pushed aside every living thing on the meadows, putting it in a pump of dirt over the space where one of the yellow scattered strings had been, the bulldozers retreated to cheers, a job done. Trees stood shaken. This wasn't grazing when roots could sprout back or digested seeds could be shot out to grow more pre-fertilized grass. This wasn't fire that laid down a rich layer of ash and encouraged hidden seeds to sprout. This was something new. All the grass of chaparral had been uprooted and buried. Snakes had been cut in half and crushed by the bulldozers. The older bunnies had fled for the remaining chaparral, while the younger ones, too little to flee, had also been crushed. Enormous familial cities of insects gone. The wind whipped across the bare dirt, and dust rose up to clog tree stomachs and choke man and beast alike. But the next day, the men were prepared with damp bandanas across their mouths, and down came a truck carrying what looked like a giant's rolling pin, hard and metal and spiky. They attached it to an enormous machine which powered it with the great big man at the wheel. The purpose of this vehicle was to lay down the equivalent of a concrete foundation, something worth building a house on for all time. As the rolling pin was lowered, the men shouted. They had noticed rock. The rock was not crushed. They stopped with the rolling pin and got a winch and a crane to come over from a field out of visual range and treat guests that other precious valleys were being destroyed on this bleak day. And the winch was attached to rock, and the crane, without leaving the far side of the creek, hoisted rock up and over and dumped E in the truck, which drove away. By the time tree and rock figured out what was being done, each was too far from the other to hear goodbye. Then the vehicle pushing the rolling pin, itself tall and a man, came across the creek, and the driver lowered the pen, not only knowing enough to touch the ground, but enough to drive the ground 12 inches lower than it had been before. All the airspace between the dust and the dirt, all the hidden places for insects to crawl and roots to burrow was pushed out. The man pulled another lever and the rolling pin drove even deeper and the ground gave out first a sigh, then a squeaky noise like a mouse with a tail being stepped on. Concentrating, he began to follow the markings on the ground to create the foundation for the house. As he moved forward, the rolling pin came over the first tips of tree's roots, flattening them like rock hill. Tree, of course, was still very much alive, and the pain caused you to give a great bellow that echoed across the whole of the valley and poured over the rim of the mountains. Trees who had never known Tree in a hundred or two hundred years cringed in response. The compactor moved slowly forward, and Tree not, tried not to inflict his agony about the entire universe, but it was impossible not to yell. While the compactor had made a straight line, starting about fifty yards from the creek and heading back about a hundred yards, he turned a right angle and headed straight towards Tree. Now the pain was escalated by pure terror. Was the machine going to knock Tree down or crush his roots up to the trunk? Tree yelled so loudly that the oldest tree in the forest, two and a half miles away as the red hell hawk flies, heard this moment of grief and terror and sent forth a love prayer, quiet as a flick of air. It reached Tree like a mother's embrace, and he clung to it as a compactor came closer and closer and then stopped, a big three yards away, making another right turn and heading back to the creek. The half a day this took was the longest day tree could imagine existing in the universe, for underneath every portion of the smooth, flattened dirt, now hard as concrete, lay miles of interlaced roots, both trees and those of other trees, and the long grass roots of purple needle grass. Dead now, more dead than he ever imagined, for nothing else would be able to eat them up and incorporate them into some new life. The other three quarters of trees' roots were shriveling and wiggling in the ground of terror, the driver, driver lifted the metallic rolling pin, backed up, turned around, and headed up the hill. His colleagues congratulated him on the project, swift and clean. Not a one of them had heard the shrieking, though one had had a dog who was cowering under his master's old red shovey, whimpering and moaning. The owner could not figure out why his dog had freaked out and finally cajoled him with a friend's half-finished hamburger uh, from underneath and into the front seat. When he got into his truck to drive away, he found the enormous German shepherd perched in his lap and unwilling to move. So he drove home with his nice 
laced around the dog's head so he could see where the heck he was going. He knew his wife would be irritated that he smelled so thoroughly a dog, but what could he do? A bad cat turned his back on a whimpering dog. And then this last one is in honor of the drought that we've been experiencing. And uh, this is when tree is very tiny indeed. They can barely a little sprout. And tree's been hanging in there, but there's been no rain for a long time at this point in the story. As the days crept on, tree gradually stopped growing and started enduring, and eventually shriveling a little, even drooping. There was no more water to provide the tension needed to keep a small young plant upright. Tree's love for the hot light was unabated, but Tree's appreciation for nighttime grew. Nighttime was cool. Dew fell. It was relaxing after enduring dehydration to at least feel better for some hours, but the moisture below was so very far away. How could Tree get moisture? Where was water? Where did it come from? Tree yearned, inarticulate and passionate, for a solution to all this. And then the Santa Anas came, and Tree was flattened by these wild winds of late fall that seemed to double the heat and to elicit all sorts of crazy yearnings in the animals that traverse the hillsides. Tree felt it too, that sense that magic could happen, that the future is just around the next instant, that if you wanted it enough, it would be yours, if only you wanted it enough. Whatever it was, the winds poured on and on. For an hour, the little oak tree was bent nearly to the ground. Sometimes it withstood the onslaught, bending only a little. Two days worth of desiccating welter and tumult, and then a stillness. The heat deepened. Tree could feel tree's very life. Already, tree had known beauty and love and fear and sorrow, and now it was coming to an end. The next night was cool, and in the morning, yesterday's turquoise sky was now completely gray. And cool drops plopped down under the earth, first slowly and then more swiftly. A tree uncurled, reaching up with a rugged triumphant figure, just as tree had first uncoiled to hit the hot light full on. The drops fell on tree, tree's thin bark and leaves, two more now, sucked them in pure. And as the ground grew soft and then liquid, tree's root puffed up like the tummy of a pregnant bunny, fat and white and full of good things. The littler tendrils snake down to the ground, embracing this portion of earth ever more deeply. From the center of tree's core, tree cried out to the universe, life is good, and the rain came down like laughter. That's my three pieces for you guys. Thank you so much. If you have any questions or comments, I welcome it, and often I ask people to tell me if you have a tree story of your favorite tree that you've experienced, and i got to tell you from all the book events I've, I've done, other people's tree stories are, are like life's blood to me. It's just beautiful to hear. So please let me know what you got, or any thoughts you have on how to get out of the entrance and into the bio scene, because I think that's the great work of our, our generation and the next generation. That is a great question. Um, I <laughs> had this. Need it, it okay, question. the question was how long. Uh, is your name Pat? Terry. Oh, sorry. Terry's question was how long did it take you to write the book? So I had this brainstorm when I had a job that to me was just desperately boring and it just suddenly came to me the whole thing of it. So that first weekend, I just was on fire. I wrote night and day for three days. And the next Monday, I realized I gotta do some homework. So I spent off and on five to 10 years doing research. And at the same time I was writing, and what happened is the easy part of the book wrote itself, the first two, like two thirds of the book. And then there were all these pieces that I was like kind of stuck. And I was overwhelmed with raising children and my job, and like, what am I gonna do? And so I had this friend, Ozzy Silva, who was a billionaire who lived in Malibu, and he supported my work as a watershed coordinator. And one day I met him for coffee randomly, and he goes, he could do anything in the world. What do you wanna do? And I said, I have this book that I think is why I was put here. And he goes, how much would it take you to finish the book? And I said, $10,000. He goes, that's ridiculous. How about six? So I said, thank you. <laughs> and that gave me the money I needed to take two months to finish. And if I had funding, I could have written the whole book in under a year. But like doing it on the edges of my life was really hard. And so I owe Ozzy, and he made me promise never to tell anyone, but you guys passed away. So I could say Ozzy
Cosby, I love you, but I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> he would be happy to be famous. <laughs> he said, he, said I, he, he didn't say I couldn't tell after he left us. And he knows I love him. I think he can <laughs> I think Ozzy wants us to get your mom's story out. Because I was all upset to say, please, I want to thank Ozzy. We need more Ozzy's to support more authors and storytellers. Because Peter is also a storyteller. And there's nothing like storytelling to start to open the heart, to change our minds to know what the truth is and what we need to do. So please, uh, Ozzy, I'm sure you're in the ethers. You're here through this beautiful book. I personally want to thank you through me. That's, oh, that's very sweet. Now, was Ozzy your friend? Sorry, Ozzy was our friend, but he was also a donor to the Malibu Creek Watershed. I work at the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh -huh. And he liked to hang out and hold court at the Starbucks in Malibu. And I would often, you know, go grab a coffee. And if I saw him, I'd just join his table because he was a friend, you know. And so he just had this impulse to say, what would you really like to be doing with your life? And I had to check in three days. Wow. Yeah. And he goes, don't tell anybody because otherwise they're all going to show up at my doorstep. <laughs> but now he can show up at his doorstep and he can't help me. So I feel like I'm okay to tell. <laughs> I think we can stop at his doorstep and see what happens because all kinds of miracles will happen. And he was a mesh. And with stories like this, it will change human beings' hearts to learn to listen as you listen to tree and I listen, or grasses, and I listen to rose bushes and others have their story, because if we learn to listen, we can respond from the heart. And we start all responding from the heart, and we've seen some movements over time, you know, where people throughout the globe got together way back and were singing, I forget what it was, but people unified, people unified to address Katrina. We can unify to address our very futures going to stop there because I'm sure others would like to share too. Questions or comments? Yes? Or thoughts? I think you're leaving us speechless. You've touched our hearts so deep. Okay. Well, should I I'm sorry. Go ahead. You go ahead. What was the name of the two authors that you said you needed? So Peter Wallaben is W-O-H-H-L-E-B-E-N and his first, he's, he, all of his books are great. But the first one that he came out with, it blew up the New York Times, was a bestseller list. And it, it's a game changer. It, and it's really nice because each little chapter is a different piece of arboreal science. And so you could kind of read one a night before you go to sleep when half of them has a treat. And it's, it's just packed with great information. And uh, his third book I love because he is worrying about this species or tiny microbe that they found in groundwater two miles down and how fracking might hurt it. And I thought, what a great guy that he's worrying about a tiny little microbe that none of us are ever going to see, because I'm like, that's the mentality that we need. The other one is, um, her name is Dr. Suzanne Samard, S-I-M-A-R-D, and she is a, a forest professor out up in um, Canada, and she uh, figured out that she thought this fungus was connected to these two trees and developed this amazing series of research experiments to show that they were, in fact, using the fungal networks to transfer water, transfer food, and connect to each other. And now there's like, graduate students all around the world who are replicating this work, which is really fun because you're like, oh, science in action, you know? Um, not a part, I don't have a book by him per se, but uh, I have to call out uh, Sir Bose, E-O-S-E, who was a scholar in India in the late 19th century up through the 20s, who he decided, he did research that showed that plants were talking to each other electrically, and the European scientists were just did this and didn't, didn't hear what he said, and now there's been all this research that showed his approach was right. And I love it because he was 100 years ahead of everybody else. And uh, India is really proud of him. He's kind of like their, their answer to, uh, I don't know, Leonardo da Vinci or something. Who needs time travel? Who needs time travel? A B O S E. This is last name. Like, B O S E. Yeah. Okay. Your first name is. 
Chandrika, and I think I can spell it, but I'm on camera, so maybe I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to get around to that. Yeah. Uh, have you written other books? I am trying to write the next one, but Ozzy's dead, so i got to, bless his heart, so i got to find another daughter. <laughs> but I'm partway through the second one, and I'm, I'm really excited about it, because I think it's like the next stop, which is really looking at the Gaia theory, which is like the book of supposes that the Earth itself might be a living being. What is that like? It is a living being. Yeah. Do you follow Benzia Shifa? I do, yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, she's all about that. Yeah, kind of yeah. And there's a definitely, you know, uh, Hindus and Buddhists and First Nations people who are working on, have been embracing these ideas for thousands of years, and I feel like we artificially cut ourselves off from them with West, Western civilization, and we need to listen to people who didn't do that because they, their way is the way for us. Right? That's kind of what the book Ishmael talks about. Right. So how people are going to come together and see the and the universe. Well, I think, I think the problem is this idea that, that when you look at the Judeo Christian Islamic monolith, it's this idea that our relationship with the other is God, and that's what matters. And if you look at uh, the spiritual traditions of First Nation peoples or in the Hindus or Buddhists, in each case, they're like, we belong to all of us, and all of us belongs to us. And that, inter that inter the interdependency is, is built into the, the religious idea. You know what I found interesting in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, in the book of Genesis, which is the cosmology of the beginning of all things, and God, the breath of life, sees that it's good, good, and human is very good, and then uh, gives them, gives us dominion. And uh, as a Latin scholar, it comes from dominus, and the dominus is the patriarch, the head of the household. And as I read a little bit of history, I'm not a historian, traditionally the head of the household or the uh, landowner, wherever we created that term, uh, is responsible for all of the workers. I've learned from some friends who are no longer walking on this earth, but that uh, they own beautiful ranches in uh, Mexico. And their responsibility as a dominus, the owner, was to take care of those farmers, those people working that plantation, that, that orchard, that you know, coconut coffee oranges, through their lives and deaths and that of their children, all those living on the land. So my understanding is something got warped where it went from the most responsible one has to take care of the responsibility of future generations. That lost in translation. As opposed to dominus, meaning dominate. Mm -hmm. And who all wants to be dominated without some kind of rebellion. You could think about that Bible religion, right? It was all translated and then interpreted in like how many different languages and right. And we all about create our loss. Yeah. We create our own mythologies and the mythology that we're living in in this culture, it's global now. Capitalism is global. Well here's a fun workaround for this. There's two fun workarounds. One is in Georgia there's a tree that has a right to itself. Nobody owns the tree, the tree owns itself. There's one tree in the United States that owns itself. What if we started giving trees self-ownership? What would that look like? How would that change how we treat ecosystems, right? Similarly, there's a number of places around the world where they've given rivers personhood. And so when a river is a person, just like with a corporation, you can sue on behalf of the river, and the river has the right to not be destroyed, right? So, so you know, if we if we rethink, like, does the land have a right to itself? Do the plants have a right to itself? Do the animals have a right to themselves? How do we how do we share resources? Because we do have to eat to live. We do need water to live. How do we share resources so that the resources are not obliterated by human perceived need or want? Right, and that's that's the way forward, I think. Yes, and it's very doable because way back in 1972, as part of the doctorate at USC in social ethics, I had the uh, privilege of sitting at the feet of a professor, I think 
their first name is Chris Stone. Mm. And he was already writing on the rights of trees. I read that when I was a teenager. I love that book. <laughs> the trees have the right to life, just as embryos. Any tree has the right to life. And there is a surmise that the book The Lorax is based on his research. <laughs> That's fabulous. And then uh, so we were working to shut down the urban oil fields here, which we've done successfully. Uh, they have a few years to get out, the legally precedent set. But what we did, there was a community um, environmental legal defense fund group that started suing on uh, the rights of nature. Yeah. You remember that cell death and the rights of nature and uh, that municipalities could, and they did a number of lawsuits to stop the fracking, but that municipalities could make the rights of nature a legal right just as a business had a legal right. And there were a number of communities who did and a number of communities who were able to survive the uh, you know, the lawsuits that come from the fracksters, etc. By the way, when you talked about your friend who's researching the microbe and this tiny microscope. I wish you were my friend. He's a famous writer. <laughs> the famous writer. But when you think of a microbe, right, and, and oh, this guy, think of the microbe called COVID, and it stopped an entire planet. It affected an entire planet. It almost broke the legs of capitalism. So don't don't ever belittle yourself as a human or a microbe that's committed to change. Well, I just hope you all will enjoy reading Tree and um, find a path to connecting to the plants in your own life and the animals in your own life. Yes. And thank you for spending time with us today. We appreciate it. And two closing comments. First, thank you everyone for being here. Lena, especially you. Second Greener Way is run on donations and they're voluntary, but we always give 50% to the presenters. So if anyone would like to leave a donation, there's the, on the table, there's the brochure for Greener Way and one for saving the wetlands and one to learn heartfulness meditation, if that's of interest. But the most important closer I'd like to say is Melina has brought some books, and if you'd like to buy at least one for yourself, or at least two, one for yourself, and one to give away, imagine if we started buying two or three, and we start giving them to friends, signed by the author, and I, I see we have a fan, I'm in your club too, but we can start being the first steps, as Margaret Mead said, it's always that small group that's committed, who gets the change going. So Molina will be more than happy, and you could do it in the shade, although I have set up the table. The table is great. Uh, you know, wherever you want to come and see Molina, talk with Molina, buy some books, and we will take it from there. Thank, Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. Okay. Wow, I'm going to go.